Coming up, there are stories out there about political candidates all around the country having extreme difficulty trying to find political consultants because Mike Bloomberg has hired them all. How can you hire that many people, spend over $400 million, and not be adequately prepared for a debate? Well, you know what? Just because you spent a lot of money doesn't mean you spent it well. Welcome back to Political Spirits. I'm your host, Franklin Rye. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? How many times have political analysts elevated a candidate as the presumptive nominee or a huge challenge to the front runner or the one to beat, only to have their predictions prove no more reliable than the rantings of a plastered patron at the local pub guaranteeing a particular result in the upcoming election? Setting aside for a moment the examples from the Democrat presidential nomination contests this time around and setting aside the 2016 campaign momentarily, Let's focus on 2008. How many times in the run-up to the 2008 election were we told in the months leading up to the opening caucuses and primaries for the Republican nomination for president that Rudy Giuliani was the leading candidate? He was, after all, America's mayor. The pundits were all in. Giuliani's strategy skipped the initial caucuses and primaries and focused on the big states like Florida. Does that ring any bells for you? So how did that work out for him? As John McCain gained momentum, Rudy Giuliani was left waiting for the Florida primary. Without primary and caucus wins under his belt, he struggled to be at the head of the news cycle. Sure, the pundits kept talking about him like he was the leading candidate, but he didn't have any wins under his belt. And in the end, he wasn't connecting with voters and didn't have a win to point to. So what happened when the Florida primary rolled around? He came in third and then abandoned his campaign. Beware the pundits' frontrunners. If a narrative builds, the pundits tend to pile on in support of it without really evaluating it anew. Let's look at the Democrat presidential nomination run this year. Beto O'Rourke was touted as a top-notch candidate, one of the leading contenders for the nomination. The accomplishment that earned him that distinction? Losing to Ted Cruz in the Texas Senate campaign. That's right, losing an election was so impressive that the pundits were talking him up as one of the leading candidates. They said keep in mind that he kept that Senate race closer than expected, losing by just under 4%. Perhaps more impressive than a fairly close margin was the fact that Beto O'Rourke raised $80 million for the campaign spending nearly every penny of it to Ted Cruz's haul of less than half that amount. But there are two ways to look at that. Sure, he raised a large amount of money, but the Democratic Party had made it a national race. Huge amounts of money were pouring into the Democratic candidate from all over the country, including enormous amounts from California. Once the campaign was nationalized on the Democratic side, The amount raised was less of a surprise and, frankly, less impressive. Losing a race with twice the money of your opponent is a questionable accomplishment to earn you the label of a leading contender for your next primary election. And the end result of Beto's presidential nomination run? We all know it. He never caught on. And, frankly, it shouldn't have surprised any of us. So we could talk about the pundit's virtual coronation of Hillary in advance of the 2016 election, but that story's been told. Let's talk about what may be the latest overinflated candidate narrative from the pundits. I'm not talking about Joe Biden, although I certainly could given the subject. 
I'm talking about Mike Bloomberg. The pundits have been talking him up for weeks as the Democrat to take down Trump. Now we know his fortune is staggering. Donald Trump is certainly extremely wealthy, and he spent hundreds of millions of dollars on his campaign in 2016. But in the end, Hillary Clinton outspent him by about two to one. There's a certain irony to the fact that Trump was able to beat his opponent while spending half as much. Then two years later, his principal opponent for the Republican nomination in 2016 was able to beat his Senate competition, Beto O'Rourke, in 2018 while spending half as much. Given President Trump's acknowledged propensity for boastfulness, I'm kind of surprised that he hasn't said that Ted Cruz was able to win because he taught him in the 2016 general election how to win while spending half as much as your opponent. Having said all of that, nobody can deny that Mike Bloomberg has a tremendous advantage because of his ability to spend and vocal commitment to spend massive amounts of his own money trying to win the Democrat nomination and then the presidency. He's even spent nearly as much on advertising in the primary election as Donald Trump did in 2016 in the entire general election. If he were to win the Democratic nomination, he could outspend President Trump by four, six, or even eight times. The numbers are staggering. But you don't count dollars spent to determine the winner. You count votes. And in the case of former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg, There won't even be any votes to count until Super Tuesday on March 3. Not in Iowa, not in New Hampshire. Don't talk to me about that write-in vote he received in Dixville Notch. Not in Nevada, not in South Carolina. All that publicity from all those states could be sucked up by his competitors, most notably Bernie Sanders, before Michael Bloomberg gets the chance to tout even a single vote received. But hey... He's got all that money to run all those TV ads trying to convince voters that something that didn't happen, an endorsement from Barack Obama, actually did happen. And of course he has the debates. That's his chance. Surely someone with more than 10 times as much money as Donald Trump and who won the mayorship of New York City in multiple elections must have honed some serious skills in debate. Well, apparently not. Mike Bloomberg's performance in the Democrat debate last Wednesday night was weak at best and pathetic at worst. Multiple candidates attacked him, but it was Elizabeth Warren who darn near shredded him. But it wasn't the attack which was the most revealing. It was the inadequate response. How on earth could Mike Bloomberg not have anticipated attacks based on settlement of gender discrimination and sexual harassment lawsuits? There are stories out there about political candidates all around the country having extreme difficulty trying to find political consultants because Mike Bloomberg has hired them all. How can you hire that many people, spend over $400 million, and not be adequately prepared for a debate? Well, you know what? Just because you spent a lot of money doesn't mean you spent it well. There's no doubt that the Bloomberg Television Advertising Blitz has been effective. He's ranked third nationally in the Real Clear Politics average of polls, and the only thing he's done is run ads. But there's a lot more to running a campaign than advertisements, and the ineffective job of prepping Bloomberg for his first debate might be indicative of how the campaign operates when it comes to functions beyond creating ads. And incidentally, even as to the ads themselves, there's a question about those. Given that in one of them, Bloomberg actually touts the fact that he was able to lead New York City through the aftermath of 9-11. The problem, of course, with that claim is that Rudy Giuliani, not Mike Bloomberg, was mayor at that time. This isn't a Joe Biden forgetting where he is mistake. This is an actual ad drafted and approved by the campaign and then released with nobody catching the fact that Mike Bloomberg wasn't the mayor during the time referenced in the ad. That's a pretty serious mistake, and it makes you wonder just how well run this campaign is going to be. So did the incredibly weak performance at the debate do serious damage to Bloomberg's campaign? I expected it to. 
When you're talked up as the well-funded, huge threat about to enter the race and you show up in competition for the first time and lay an egg, it tends to take away the mystique. So how much did it take away? Well, a morning consult poll taken before and after the debate combined positive views and negative views of Bloomberg before and after the debate And in almost every political viewpoint category, it showed a net loss for Bloomberg of from 16 to 30 percent. That's huge. Will it hold? Can he recover? Well, it's far too early to write Mayor Bloomberg's political epitaph in this campaign. But the bottom line is if he's going to mount a serious challenge to Bernie Sanders, he's going to have to do serious debate preparation. That may be a lot more difficult than effectively outsourcing your campaign to an ad agency. But if any candidate intends to be taken seriously, he should at least be able to put together a decent debate performance. We shall see. Next topic. A prescription for trouble. Listen to this podcast for any length of time and you'll realize that I share President Trump's commitment to advancing blue-collar jobs, to securing the return of manufacturing jobs, and to securing wage gains for the working class. How many times have you heard the criticism of globalist policy that America eliminated its own middle class and built one in China? There's more than a little truth to that. But I don't think most of the public understands the scale of the problem with the loss of the American manufacturing base. Put yourself in a situation where you have to look not just to the point of final assembly of a product, but whether you have to examine the country of manufacture of each one of its components. Now ask yourself how likely you are to find those components were manufactured in the U.S. If, God forbid, we ever end up in a war, we are going to be in an incredibly difficult position because of our dependence on supply chains from foreign countries. I'll bet at this moment a lot of you are thinking it's not realistic to envision that kind of major conflict, something close to being on scale with the world wars. But I don't think we can ever lose sight of what has happened in the past because it could happen again. Moreover, the loss of our manufacturing base doesn't just become a problem in the event of a worldwide conflict. What about a worldwide crisis that isn't a war? What about a pandemic? We've certainly spent plenty of time recently thinking about that possibility the last several weeks. The coronavirus is terrifying, and it could easily turn into a worldwide pandemic. And the country at the center of it is China a country on which we are incredibly dependent for our supply chain. I saw a graph recently which depicted countries around the world with more than 35% of their supplies of components coming from China. I would expect Europe to be rife with countries above the 35% threshold. It isn't. I would expect Australia to be above that 35% threshold. It isn't. But you know which country is above that 35% threshold? the United States of America. You're probably thinking that the U.S. is in the same situation as most of the countries in the Western Hemisphere in that respect, and you'd be wrong. Only one other country in the Western Hemisphere gets more than 35% of its components from China. Canada, you guess? Nope. Chile. Countries throughout North and South America, with the exception only of Chile and the USA, have managed to keep their dependence on China for components below 35%. You might be thinking that's not a big deal. But think about this. The United States still leads the world in the production of new medicines. We are still the leading researcher, the leading discoverer, the leading developer of new medicines. But you know what we aren't? We aren't a leading manufacturer of medicines. And on which country are we most dependent for the manufacture of medicine? You guessed it, China. So whenever over time we look to the Far East, we look to China and we look in fear, fear that the coronavirus will explode into a pandemic engulfing the world, and we're hard at work on a vaccine. One American laboratory has arrived at a potential vaccine formula 
within three hours after being given the genomic sequence for coronavirus. The testing process, though, through animals and then humans, of course, will take many months. But when it comes time to actually manufacture the resultant drug, the odds are it will be manufactured in China. The bottom line is we are far too dependent on China for our products, medicines perhaps most of all. If there's anything positive that will come out of this terrifying outbreak of disease, it's that the world, especially America, will be forced to reckon with its dependence on China for manufacturing. Look at what's happened to manufacturers dependent on China for their parts. Hyundai has shut down all three of its South Korean factories because it can't get the parts it needs from China due to the coronavirus quarantines throttling manufacturing there. One of those Hyundai factories is the largest car manufacturing facility in the world. You might be thinking that when the coronavirus outbreak is over, everything will just return to what has been normal in worldwide manufacturing. Companies will continue to be heavily dependent on China, including having China as their sole source of parts or their primary supplier of finished goods. I don't think so. I think things are going to change because companies aren't going to be able to explain to their shareholders why they put all their supply eggs in a single basket. Going forward, I predict they'll have to have alternatives. Those alternatives could include other Far East countries like Vietnam, but in light of the disruptions from viruses coming out of the Far East like SARS and coronavirus, they may feel they have to also have suppliers from other parts of the world. That could be a boon for U.S. manufacturing. And even if it isn't, it could be a boon for Mexico. It could be a boon for low-labor-cost Eastern European countries. But the bottom line is it won't be a boon for China. And in the end, notwithstanding the initial cost increases for Western manufacturers, that will be a good thing for America. Next topic. Bernie Rolls. Let's talk just briefly about the Nevada Democratic Party caucuses. As expected, Bernie Sanders won, and he won decisively. Any way you slice it, it was a big day for Bernie Sanders. And any way you slice it, it was an anxiety-producing day for the Democratic Party. The Democrat Party is rapidly approaching one of two outcomes, neither of which is desirable for it. The first is that Bernie Sanders wins the nomination with more than 50% on the first ballot. That could happen. Candidates that win repeatedly tend to win with growing margins. The commentators who confidently opine that no single candidate will receive more than 50% on the initial ballot haven't really taken that growth margin into account. People just like to support winners. And if Bernie Sanders keeps winning, he'll be winning with larger and larger margins. Looking just at the popular vote total, Sanders won each of the first three contests, the first time that's ever happened. So why is that possibility less than desirable for the Democratic Party? Because Bernie Sanders is a socialist. He's outside the norm in the United States. He's likely to drive away huge numbers of Democrat voters. And whether they vote for Donald Trump or simply don't vote, either way, they'll go a long way towards making sure that Donald Trump wins re-election. To prevent that, if given the option, the Democrat Party will make sure that Bernie Sanders doesn't get the nomination. How? If Bernie Sanders doesn't have more than 50% of the delegates by the time the convention rolls around, then he won't get the nomination on the first ballot. In that event, the superdelegates, the party bigwigs, come into play and can ensure that an alternative candidate gets the nod. Michael Bloomberg is hoping it's him, but it could be anybody. Moreover, the Democrat Party could change the rules, returning them to the old form which was in place before the 2016 election, when the superdelegates vote on the first ballot. In that event, they could likely throw it to Bloomberg or another candidate close behind if they wished. In that respect, it's worth noting that Joe Biden finished second in Nevada. It was a distant second, but nowhere near as distant as Elizabeth Warren or Pete Buttigieg. 
Biden is actually still alive in the race, although perhaps only technically. We'll have to wait to see what happens with his South Carolina firewall. But whether they change the rules and allow the superdelegates to vote on the first ballot, or they leave them in place and don't allow the superdelegates to vote until the second ballot, either way, the likelihood of losing huge numbers of Sanders supporters in the general election if the party doesn't award the nomination to Bernie Sanders is high. Either way, it's a huge problem for the Democrats. You know what's not a problem? Following political spirits. We don't change the rules. We release a new episode every week for your listening pleasure. And I look forward to releasing a new one next week. Be sure to tell your friends about Political Spirits and like the podcast on Facebook at Political Spirits. And follow me and the podcast on Twitter at Franklin Rye. And I have a big announcement. The Political Spirits website is up and running. You'll find it at political-spirits.com. You'll find graphic cover pages for each new audio episode. You'll find my bio and even a photo, which may prove I have a face for radio. There are links to world news stories of interest and related articles. Shortly, one will be posted, which I wrote for another conservative website, explaining why I chose to start a podcast. And a discussion forum is coming soon. Incidentally, you'll also find the 11 Maxims of Political Spirits. When you go to the website, remember to subscribe. That's a lot of content. And we're on Instagram now as well at Political Spirits. And remember, all episodes are now on YouTube also. And the YouTube channel is named Political Spirits Network. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And select all after you hit the bell. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.